Hello and welcome to the Machine Learning Podcast, the podcast about going from idea to delivery with machine learning. Your host is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Boaz Hecht about using AI to automate customer support at 8Flow. So Boaz, can you start by introducing yourself? Yeah, thanks Tobias, thanks for having me. Nice to meet you today. And uh, my name is Boaz, I'm a founder of a company called 8Flow. We, uh, we're based in the Bay Area and LA, and we're three founders who've worked together basically for the last 10 years, previously selling a company to ServiceNow and then running a bunch of stuff there. Uh, nice to meet you. And do you remember how you first got started working with machine learning? So as I said, I we previously had a company, it was a, an enterprise mobility platform, ServiceNow acquired in 2017. And while I was there, I, I ended up running a bunch of different things, including a bunch of AI stuff, specifically AI chatbots came under my group. And um, this was in 2018. So 2017, they, were, they acquired a company. And in 2018, I took over the management of the product. And while we were running it, there was a massive investment in the whole NLU aspect and the general work around deflection of tickets, where as a company, you have tickets you want to deflect as much as you can. And then you have the tickets that are not able to be deflected. And then you have a virtual agent that's able to interact with you. And so there was a huge investment in that. And I kind of own that at ServiceNow. And now getting to 8Flow, can you give a bit of an overview about what it is that you're building there and some of the story behind how it came to be and why you decided to spend your time and energy on it? Sure. So as an overview, what it does is basically a workflow automation engine that learns instead of you having to configure it. And the reason for that is it almost like a philosophical premise where in the past, in my previous company, we had a builder for mobile apps. We had an integration service. You had to configure that. When I was at ServiceNow, I probably owned about 20 different builders from NLU, chat, logic, web apps, and a bunch of other stuff. And what I saw in the enterprise is that you have so many thousands of systems and you have so many different nuanced workflows that people are doing that really it's not a scalable operation to say I'm going to have somebody building stuff for other people, meaning the IT organization has to configure builders or the SIs that they bring in to configure builders. And so we said, okay, what if we didn't do that? What if we democratize that and basically learned what people are doing individually? And as we learned what they're doing, we create automations for themselves. So we built it right now. It's a Chrome extension with a bunch of other data collection stuff where it learns what people are doing. And as it learns what they're doing, it suggests automations. That's what it is. And it's for support, but also for finance or claims adjustment or any repetitive tasks that organizations do. And given the area of focus that you're building towards, it sounds a lot like what people are using RPA or robotic process automation frameworks for right now. And I'm curious if you can give a bit of an overview about what the overlap looks like, why somebody might want to use 8Flow instead of an RPA or an association with an RPA and kind of what that Venn diagram looks like for people who are in the market to say, I want to make things work more routinely and I want to automate things and just curious kind of how they approach that decision process given those options. Yeah, it's a great question. I'll give my perspective. I don't know if it's the right one, but I, that's my perspective. I think RPA as a general rule is the premise of it is let's define a process. Once we've identified a process, let's automate it. And I think that's incredibly valuable when you have a defined process. But I think in the enterprise, invariably, you have thousands of different defined processes that are not identical. And so RPA gets a bad rap for being brittle, for being non-updated, and the investment required relative to the ROI is problematic because you have to invest in building the automation, and then you have to maintain it. And so generally speaking, if you're a CIO, you say, okay, it costs $30,000 to configure a robot. I'm going to pay whatever the business model of the RPA company is, but I'm going to invest in the SI to learn the process. I'm going to then automate it and I'm going to deploy it. And there's an entire deployment process for that in the enterprise from devs, sub prod, prod, all of that stuff. And so when something changes or when the nuance of the product of the process requires individual decision making, it breaks. And so a lot of times you have a lot of robots that don't get used because the nuance of the actual life process isn't the same as what was analyzed by the analysts. And so from our point of view, we think of this a little bit like 
kind of ways versus Google Maps, meaning they're building their own maps. They define a crowdsource how to build a map. And so the first time it might not be great, the second time it might not be, but then once you've defined a map, if the road changes and four people drive on it, it's now new, it's updated, whereas Google Maps is getting it annually or whatever it is that they're the process. And so from that point of view, we're saying, what if we just democratize this, gave this to every user, every user has their processes, if we can have visibility across the enterprise of what those processes are and then decide, it helps with discovery, but it also means it's way more scalable, orders of magnitude more scalable. And then the way we're building this is first principles of the same concept of you know, self-driving cars in a Tesla. We've built a car. The car is able to have cameras and it's recording and it's learning how I'm driving. And I may be driving in Palo Alto and somebody may be driving in Paris and the laws in Paris are different and the roads of Paris are different and the structure of driving is different and in London it's different. And so if we can learn that and then we add simple automation so we can control the steering wheel or we control the accelerator and the brake and whatever, then slowly we can take away different things that can be automated. And so we're doing the same. We have an extension. The extension is learning what people are doing as they do it, it then suggests automations. And as it gets more and more sophisticated, it suggests more and more automations. And they can choose whether they want to accept those automations or not. And then at the enterprise level, you have the enterprise security, all of that stuff where you can manage it. But it means that instead of saying, I'm going to deploy an, an RPA process, which is you know one, two, three, four, whatever number of robots, I'm going to actually do this with a thousand different processes. And with that capability of doing that automation and the kind of overlap of manually defining those processes versus being able to learn them and build them automatically, I'm also wondering what your thoughts have been around being able to take some of those existing predefined workflows that somebody has already codified with an RPA framework and being able to then translate that into the engine that you're building and then possibly do some automatic discovery or linkages of similar workflows that use some of those same components to then suggest, oh, hey, I see you're using Salesforce or Zendesk for this workflow of managing customer returns. Here are some other automated workflows that we are able to link you to that already take advantage of your Salesforce and Zendesk usage. That's pretty meta. Everything you just said I agree with, I think it's almost so far ahead for us versus where practically we can add value today. When, when you say that, I think of a couple of things. One is that's assuming the RPA processes that have been defined are successful and good. And by definition, those ones are a low number, whatever that is. And so the value add, generally speaking, when you have an Accenture or a Deloitte or whoever is coming in and implementing an RPA, generally speaking, their approach is much more, let's understand the process and realize whether we even need to build an RPA rather than is the process correct in the first place? Because I'm going to invest in building an RPA, so I might as well just invest in actually fixing the process again anyway. And so I think what you're saying is right, but it's almost further along the value chain than where, generally speaking, I would imagine enterprises are, which is if I'm going to look at this, I might as well look at the investment holistically already, especially given AI, especially given where the technologies are today and the amount of legacy applications that exist in the enterprise. And then the second part is when you look at RPA deployment processes, it's really like the discovery, the definition, the building of the robots, and then the deployment. And there has been a lot of work done on the discovery of how can people discover, but it's completely disjointed from the building. And what we're saying is it, it shouldn't be. Meaning you can discover, there's a bunch of acquisitions, I think of RPAs where they buy these things that learn what the process is, and then somebody manually then looks and sees, okay, how can I convert this into a, a robot? If it's not a flywheel that just self-perpetuates, you still have the same limitations. And then in that process of people coming to your tool, deciding how or whether it fits into their requirements, how much does the fact that you are using ML and AI under the covers sell? Do they even care about that? Or is it mainly just about, these are the things that we can do for you yeah, that's great that you're using ML and AI, whatever, because we're an enterprise and we eat that for lunch. So I think this conversation is different if we'd have had it literally 12 months ago. I think it distracts. I think there is a lot of buzz around AI and because of ChatGPT and generally the kind of the press about it, I think what's happened is people think it can do way more than it can do. 
And so we get into these conversation where you're like, oh, what if we just did away with a bunch of stuff? And you're like, you're using SAP from 2012, where you're using whatever it is. And so it's very much not, we have a customer who's much more realistic about it. They understand they have SAP from 2012. They have another, and they're just using systems across each other. They know where it is. And then we have, we have a different customer who's looking at how do you complete your way, which is amazingly innovative, but they're, the conversation has to be brought back to, okay, where can you actually apply this? I also think just coming from ServiceNow, I spent four years running a pretty large team there. They are heavily investing in this. This is more of a win for the incumbents than for the startups, meaning Salesforce and ServiceNow and Zendesk and Microsoft can embed all of the auto responses, the, the deflection stuff natively in their product much more easily than all of the chatbots that have existed in the last kind of five, 10 years outside of those. And so I think it's more that, and we're trying to kind of stay away from it and say like, look, we're just, we're using AI, but we're using AI in the classic sense of what you understand. Yes, Gen AI is giving it a boost because we can build or, or fine tune models that will help us for specific things, but we are not a chatbot or something like that. And so I think that because of the press, that has led to conversation where you have to set the stage in a more complicated way than you did a year ago. And an interesting aspect too of the rapid proliferation and arms race around generative AI and the competing models is that by not being a facade on top of those, it reduces the platform risk for you as well as for your customers because they don't have to worry about, oh, if OpenAI suddenly folds be under the pressure of lawsuits, then now I have to go and find a new vendor. And you don't have to say, oh, because I'm relying on Llama 2 and it doesn't work for this new use case, then I'm all of a sudden up the creek without a paddle. That is exactly right. My last company was pre-2017, and so it was in the more normal times of, of tech venture, and so it was more conservative. And then my new company is 2022 plus, so again, back to the normal. So I think there's, a, there's almost a dissonance between the companies that were like, look, let's raise $500 million or whatever it is to build stuff. And you're like, but what's the actual business outcome or whatever it is that you're doing? And so I think you're absolutely right. I also think it's, if I look at, open AI or, or any of the other alternatives or, or even like the open source models, I think you use it for function rather than base your business on it. And it's the same as I wouldn't build a business built on top of Salesforce or on top of ServiceNow or on top of Microsoft only because it just means I don't own my destiny. And so it has to be a business that's standalone that adds value independently of whatever third party APIs I use. And if I can own it myself, which is what we're doing, I will do because otherwise I don't have the defensibility and the, the IP that I can then compete and continually compound the value of. It's just somebody else's IP that I'm compounding. And then the final point is the data security in the enterprise. That there are so many companies that exist today that are trying to kind of use it, Gen AI to automate enterprise processes where one, you need to feed your entire data set into it. And that doesn't work for most enterprises. And two, the data sets are so complex that it doesn't apply in the case of an enterprise. Whereas what we're saying is, how do I take the metadata and learn from the metadata? Enterprises are okay with us learning that. I do not want the value itself. I do not want the actual tickets or addresses or whatever of customers because I don't want that risk. I don't need it. I need to build something that learns how to work on top of, I have a social security in one system and I have a social security in another system. One's called SSN, one's called social security. I don't care about the value. I care about the fact that you moved the social security from one system to another. And the fact that it was social security, I shouldn't even know. It's just a field called SSN. If it's, I know what it is because I can, as a human, read it, but it shouldn't matter. It's just a field with whatever the metadata of it is. And digging deeper on that, it's interesting thinking through the data security, data privacy aspects, the aspect of control over information boundaries, and the fact that you are embedding into those workflows of people who do have access to some of that sens sensitive information for that bounded use case of issuing a return or issuing a credit or whatever the 
specific use case might be. I'm wondering if you can talk to the sources of signal that you're using for feeding into and building the models that are powering your engine and some of the ways that you manage those boundaries of control and privacy for that sensitive data so that you don't have to worry about accidentally gaining control of it or leaking information into a model that you don't want to actually have because it increases your personal risk. And that's almost the entire basis of the company. So we're very enterprisey. Previous companies are more about like it was very, very core backend enterprise ERP. And so you, the risk tolerance is zero. And so in our case, we have built this fundamentally as being two different types of almost learnings. There is the learnings about what people are doing and what they're doing, regardless of what it is that they're using to do it. And that the entire product is built in a way where we don't even have access to it. There is some stuff that's local, meaning you copy a social security number, you see the number, you need to use it or an address or whatever. That value never leaves your computer. That value stays local. We never see it. We don't know. And if the risk of us as a company, we, we don't want the liability. And so from our point of view, that stays local. The metadata around that, what is it that you are copying from where to where? What were you doing as a user? That's important. There's user privacy, obviously GDPR, whatever, but it's that's contractual in the enterprise. That's a different set of privacy issues. For us, it's kind of almost triple the complexity. And if you look at all the, like you said, kind of the, the API wrappers, the moment you're an API wrapper, you can't distinguish between the two. You have to send it all because you're reliant on something else. And so for us, we're passing it before it ever actually leaves the local computer, which is the complexity of what we're building. And then as we pass it, we're then able to say, okay, this is data that we want to mine because it's metadata and will teach our model. And this is data that's actual proprietary customer data. It is ne- like, it's very easy for us to prove that none of that leaves the local computer. It's very easy, you know, we can do pen tests, we can do all the stuff with SOC 2 compliant, all of those things. It, there's a clear d- split between those data sets. Hope that answered the question. Yeah, no, it's definitely useful because as you said, being able to learn on the metadata, not the actual data makes it easier to sell into these companies where data security is of paramount importance because otherwise they're going to get fined millions of dollars because of the scale of their business and the potential impact of leaking any of that information. Correct. Which, you know, goes back to your question before about, about how many people do they like AI or whatever. I think it's very buzzy, but I think the moment it goes to security, security is like, wait a second, at least in, you know, the, the larger enterprises that we're working with, and it's great for the, you know, SMB, but at the large enterprise, that's just not even a discussion that's possible. Like the moment a third party says we're taking data, there's no value you can bring that will justify you taking the actual customer data and saying, I'm going to use it in a model that you don't even own. And so, you know, there are companies that are coming up with like deploying a model to the customer's cloud because it's so like the the architecture just doesn't make sense. And so we had to start from the beginning by saying, look, we just don't want to touch that. We want to learn. We want to learn the metadata, which, you know, my, my previous company was the same. We were looking at the metadata. The values themselves are not as important. And, and by the way, ServiceNow, just, you know, I'm a big fan. So they're the same. It's a metadata structure. The values themselves are interchangeable. And so that part, like, applies across customers as well. It means you're more scalable as a business. And given the fact that the workflows that you are looking to embed yourselves into are going to be heterogeneous because every company is going to have slight variances in their process. They're going to have differences in the tools that they're going to use. I'm wondering, to bring an analogy from the data engineering space, a lot of companies are using the data warehouse as the focal point to say, I know that if I integrate with the data warehouse, then I am going to be able to provide value because everybody needs to route through the data warehouse. I'm curious if there's any analog in what you're building to be able to say, as long as I can integrate with X, then I know I'm going to be able to do the majority of the workflows that people are going to ask me to do. That's a, that's a really interesting question. I don't know that I have a, an, an exact direct co- comparable. I also think there is a a major danger just generally in saying I'm going to integrate to the data warehouse because the data warehouse is, I'm not familiar with any company that I've ever met that is 
current in the data warehouse and the complexity of the constant structural change in additions and, and live systems that feed into it makes that a, a pretty scary da data reliance question. But on the on for us, I think we started with the idea that if at least for customer support, we're you know we're broader, we have like for financial or whatever, but but for customer support as a use case, you have a ticketing system that you start in, you have a ticketing system that you finish in. That's how ServiceNow, Service Cloud, Zendesk work. You have a ticket, you're dealing with the ticket, you start and you end there. In the middle, you're interacting with multiple different systems. And therefore, if I can index around you starting, you finishing, and in the middle, I'm seeing what you're doing, for us, that's been very useful. And then the other part is, I think a lot of people think that it's off-the-shelf systems, or at least operate that way, whereas basically in the enterprise, you have your ticketing system, and then you have a proprietary system that was custom built 10 years ago that is, you know, has, has been migrated to web or whatever, but, but there is no other system like that. And so you being able to say, I use Workday and I use ServiceNow, I use Service Cloud or whatever, that's great. That's not where the complexity comes in, even though that is pretty complex because of the scripting and all that. It's actually, you have an ERP from five years ago, seven years ago, that's web, that's what, but it has, you know, iframes in it. It has a bunch of customizations. It has a bunch of stuff that there is no one who knows how that works. The only person who actually can use it is using it and they don't know how to explain to you how it works. So we have to learn from that. And that's where the Waze model or the Tesla model comes in because we can, we can crowdsource it basically. Yeah. And given enterprise, there are probably also cases where it's the one system that everybody still has to run IE6 on their desktop because they're, they're still using Java server applets and that's the only way that they can manage it. And nobody is going to touch that system because nobody who's still alive even knows how it works. <laughs> Literally. And it's, and for us, you know, we, we have quite a few customers who have w Windows 10 with Internet Explorer is not where we, you know, we definitely Chrome forward, but there are, we have a bunch of customers who are like, we just moved this fat client into a web app, we have 70% of it done. We still have, and these are companies that they can't take the risk on that. That's a business critical system. And so you have to be able to operate on that. Yeah. On that premise, at least. Yeah. Having worked in tech, it's, it's always amazing how long some of these technologies will stick around, no matter how much everybody wants them to die. <laughs> Nobody stays in the company for long enough to be able to take it on, to modernize it. It's just, you know, you have AS400 still. Oh, yeah. I, I When I started in tech, I was actually in the process of installing a new AS400 at the company I was working for. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty common. Yeah, I mean, going and shopping at Lowe's up until maybe a year or two ago, I would, I would look at their point of sale systems and it was very clearly AS400 written in RPG with just, you know, the black black screen, white text, blinking cursor. <laughs> uh, every, every rental company. Yeah. <laughs> if you walk into any rental company and you walk around the desk, they're in a DOS, basically, yeah. AS400 Pro. And they have a web app, but they can't use it because it doesn't do the stuff they need. <laughs> so they're less relevant for us. But like, that's that's the world. <laughs> And now digging a bit deeper into the 8Flow platform, we've talked a little bit about some of the user experience around it, that division of the metadata versus the actual data. I'm wondering if you can talk a bit more about some of the overall system architecture and some of the ways that it has evolved and the goals have changed from when you first started working on it. Yeah, so I, I think we massively underestimated the local processing requirements and complexity of of the browser of the user behavior in the browser just because of the strict data privacy that we need to adhere to there's a lot of stuff that you need to do that needs to be done locally on the fly while not slowing down a user's computer and you have users who are in you know in their homes in india on a slow internet connection like you have to be able to have a, a performant tool that works on a chromebook not just on a you know MacBook like we all have, and so it's that the complexity of that is, has been shockingly I don't I don't know what the right word is, but it's it's the workarounds you have to come up with and the way you do it, and then the the problems that you have because of the way Chrome behaves and the APIs of Chrome and the way it is changing and evolving and with manifest V3 and the limitations on privacy has made that very complicated. We love the we're ahead on it now and we you know we've been working on this for a while and there's a bunch of IP that we've we've protected in it and stuff like that. That's a legitimate 
complexity. And then you have the other part, which is the backend data structure. And we've done it multiple times where how do we monitor the data? How do we learn? What events do we need to track? What events were absolutely useless and were unable to be mined in order for us to train anything? And then we need to redo it. But it's cool because you have, you have a constant user base that is running. And so as they use, you're learning more and more about how to do that. And in terms of the machine learning aspect of it, you mentioned we've touched on large language models. We've talked on kind of traditional stochastic and statistical models. I'm wondering if you can just talk through some of the ways that you think about the selection of model types and some of the challenges that you have around how to think about the ongoing maintenance and evolution of your model architectures and serving architectures for being able to power these workflows? I would say that at a high level, we are trying to learn a couple of fundamental things, and that's what we're training. We're trying to learn what users are doing in order to be able to understand the workflows. And as we understand the workflows, be able to predict how to complete a workflow. And so you have a completed workflow that you've already seen, but you're just adapting it slightly. And I think that's more classic machine learning, you know, they're just basically statistical history and, and kind of prediction. And then you have the more LLM type where I, I can feed it in. I have never seen this proprietary system. Now you're in this proprietary system. How can we know which field is the field that needs to be done when I don't know how to resolve a problem? And so I think those are really the user behavior that we are training, if you like. And then you have the other aspect, which is the web at large. Can we learn about the web in the enterprise that is prevalent and what exists and how do you know the structure where it's so nuanced per company, but also with historical, even historical technologies, just stuff that does, that today, if you have somebody who's deployed Angular and it's a new website and it's, that's great, but you don't have that standardization in enterprise because somebody built it seven years ago and so, or 10 years or whatever it is. And so that's the part where we need to learn. So those are really the two sides that we look at and, and we think it's, it's more about fine tuning a model than, than kind of building one. I think there are, if we look at, uh, look at other companies like Adept or whatever, where they're, you know, they're definitely capitalized on it and saying, look, we're going we're gonna to be the, the open AI aspect of it. I don't know that you need that. I think we, we definitely see that as we can learn, we can run it, and we can get, we can get accuracy. Oh, well, but that's still to be, to be determined. And as you continue to build out your product, you work with some of your early customers, see how they're using the product. I'm wondering what are some of the open questions that you still have around where specifically to focus the product? What are the, what are some of the main features that will actually sell the product into different companies and some of the ways that that will influence the future system design and evolution? Right. So I think the part that's interesting for us is the analytics aspect, which has been a basic game changer for us, meaning because we're learning and because we need to train it anyway, we have incredibly rich analytics. And so we can then use those analytics to provide insights to the customers. Some of those customers are trying to use AI for other stuff. Some of them are building integrations, whatever it is, or trying to, to improve deflection, whatever it is they're trying to do, that data set is, is incredibly valuable for them. And so we've seen, we've definitely focused more on that in the last few months than, than we thought we would, just because it's, it's definitely, especially at the executive level, they want to see it, they want to understand it, and given all the AI projects, they don't really know where to focus and what the prioritization is. And so we can give them that and say, look, you're trying to deflect, let's just say for argument's sake, you're trying to deflect tickets, which are the tickets that you can actually deflect by automation. If we see this process, it's very repetitive. You don't need to use us for the repetitive, like you can just automate it and there's still gonna be more for us. So it's kind of, we're just adding to the backlog and helping prioritize for the customer, which are the backlogs that have the highest value where is the highest cost for the user doing stuff that, that has the most prevalence? And with that repetitive workflows automation, going back to our earlier conversation about robotic process automation, I also see the potential for you to be able to say, 
we know that this is the workflow that you're doing. We will actually generate the RPA script for you so that you can feed that into your tool of choice. We don't have to be in the business of building RPA, but we will help you actually take advantage of it. That is absolutely right. And I think that's a definitely an easy next step of an export. I think it's the, I think you're, you're right. So we see customers end users and say, okay, here are my top performers. Here's how they process a refund. Here are my bottom performers. How do I coach them to be better at whatever? They don't use shortcuts or they don't, you know, their internet is slow or whatever it is. How do we help them? And then you have the actual workflow that you know is the optimal path. What can we do with that? Can we then give them that metadata around it? And then obviously, if you can integrate it, then it just feeds it. I think the complexity of RPA is that it still requires a project, no matter what. And so it isn't, no matter what, you're going to have to do the process again to identify it in the context of the RPA, unless we would directly integrate into one of them. Absolutely. And given the relative recency as a profession and as a skill set of machine learning and AI, and particularly given the massive growth and rapid pace of machine learning and AI in the industry, I'm curious how that has affected your ability to identify and obtain talent to be able to help build out your platform and your product? So I think we're all having difficulty on that. I think it's, it is a problem. I don't think I have a, a great answer. I think it is the new world. Meaning when we had my previous company was mobile. And so we learned mobile. Nobody knew mobile. It wasn't like you were like, hey, I'm going to hire mobile people. Nobody knew mobile. And so we learned it. I'm a big fan of people who learn rather than people who are experts. And so I think there are a lot of people who propose to be experts in kind of Gen AI. And there are some who are truly that. But the vast majority are people who've been playing around for the last 12 months. And if you played around for the last 12 months or we work with you and you learn on the fly, I, I don't think there's that much of a that much of a difference. And I also think the technologies like are iterating or, or evolving so fast that even what you knew 12 months ago isn't an advantage because what happened last week just completely resolves that. So it's a different world, but I think it's just a new world. And so we are all now in it versus saying, I need to hire people who have that expertise. And then on the other side, on the technical side, there is a requirement for hiring people who understand classic machine learning. And for us, that's definitely something that we are thinking about because I think that conversion is a, is a legitimate one. That's a big deal. And as you've been building 8Flow and working with some of your customers, what are some of the most interesting or innovative or unexpected ways that you've seen your tool used? I think it's a cliche that cannot be overstated enough, the amount of businesses that are run on spreadsheets. Where we all talk about these systems and we all talk about AI and we talk about learning and integrations and stuff, but there is an Excel or a Google Sheet in virtually every process that exists in the enterprise at some point in the process. And we get more and more confident about that, which is really interesting because it just demonstrates that there isn't a clear workflow path. There is subjective user decision-making in how to do it, or they have some kind of notepad process in the middle that they need to do. And that's been very eye-opening for us because it just, that whole premise of like, oh, I'm just going to use automation to learn. And in the third step, you have an Excel that somebody built, configured, and it needs to be used in the middle of the process. That just kind of, it blows up stuff, which is super interesting and cool for us because we see that on a daily basis. And... From your own experience of building the company, working in this space where ML is a core capability of the product that you're building, what are some of the most interesting or unexpected or challenging lessons that you've learned? So I think it's now become an MBO. Legitimately, a lot of people have that in their objectives for 2023 or 2024, which is unexpected for me, at least. I think the popularity of it in the non-Silicon Valley world is incredible. I don't remember that being the case for mobile even. Like it's, it was like mobile was very hyped. It was very, but it, it wasn't as prevalent. Here, pretty much every enterprise is trying to think of how to use it, which is 
awesome and shocking because it's so early. It's so nascent relative to anything else where it takes years. So that for me is totally unexpected. I think from a challenge perspective, the narrative of where it can go is scary for people. And it's scary legitimately, meaning none of us know. And it's so amorphic that a lot of times we'll speak to enterprises and we need to figure out how to have the conversation while not just going down a rabbit hole of where it could go or whatever it can. It's, it can get impractical as a conversation where it's a legitimate conversation versus impractical in other t- times where it's impractical because the person's distracted. Like in this case, it's actually legitimately a philosophical question. Will it disrupt this customer's business? And can they figure out how to use it in a way that will help them? And I think that's that for me as a, as a founder of a startup where we think of ourselves as running quickly and meeting large companies they are aware of it as a real thing, which they weren't of other trends. And for people who are in the market for figuring out how can I automate more things? How can I accelerate the ability of my staff to be able to get things done? What are the cases where 8Flow is the wrong choice? I think there are two scenarios of that. One is when you're looking for Gen AI stuff to deflect which I think is a huge value, meaning you're a company, you have 10,000 tickets or you have 10,000 whatever pieces of content or PDFs, and you need to now pass them and be able to get insights that are able to be learned by a model, not your own model, but just like you're able to, to, to interact with it using prompt engineering to do things. Aflow is not that. And it sounds like it is because it's about workflow automation, but it actually is more about the work that you need to do versus the content that you need to pass. I do think in that world, I don't see the future for all of the chatbot companies that exist today that have basically invested a lot of money in the last kind of five years in the NLU and the chatbot stuff. And really that's now commodity. And the integrations is really going to be integrated by the incumbents, the Salesforce service now, whatever, that can just use their own open source model and just pass the data for you as a customer of Salesforce and be able to auto-respond or auto-generate responses or whatever that you do. And so I think that's, we're not a fit, but it's also just use Salesforce's native or ServiceNow's native capabilities. So that that's one where we're not that. And then the other part is where you have ETL processes, where it, it's really about content analysis that the agent is doing or that the person is doing. But I also think that will also get fed into the the core capability of a for an open AI. I wouldn't start a company that passes PDFs and allows you to automate the, the contract of it or whatever, because that's just what an LLM does today. It's not even future stuff, but we're not that. That's how I would distinguish as, as scenarios where we're not relevant. Still help, we can still ha- advise or whatever, but just not. And as you continue to build and iterate on the product, what are some of the things you have planned for the near to medium term or any particular projects or problem areas you're excited to dig into? Oh, we're planning an offsite to get the team together. I think that's, a, that's an interesting one. I think we, it's incredibly satisfying to see when users are using, if I go back to the analogy of like the car, adding, getting off the highway or adding, changing lanes or adding parking or whatever, we would think of that as us adding automations. And so it's super cool for us to look at the existing data and then say, okay, what other automation can we add here? And then have a user use it and say, okay, we've learned this from what you do and now we can give you another functionality that will just help you. And all of a sudden, what you are doing, there's another thing that you can now do. And so that's how our backlog is. It's how can we take away things that you're like, oh no, I have to do this thing again and I've done it 10 times today wow, all of a sudden Aflow can do that for me. That's a big deal. That's cool. And it's legitimately business value that you can identify and and see. And it makes it very sticky. So I think that for us, that's the thing. And and then obviously when, when the predictions can work, that's a coming functionality. And so can we accurately predict and how can we increase the accuracy? Are there any other aspects of the work that you're doing at 8Flow, your applications of machine learning, the overall problem domain of workflow automation that we didn't discuss yet that you'd like to cover before we close out the show? I'd love to hear from you just a little bit of kind of what your, how you see this market. 
super interesting. Obviously, you, you're meeting companies, you're seeing the underlying technology. What, what do you see? I see a lot of ambition. Everybody wants to bring AI into their product, whether it makes sense or not, just because everybody else is doing it. So there's definitely a bit of an arms race aspect to it. I think that there is a lot of kind of fear of missing out where if you don't add AI to your product in some way, then you're going to get left behind. So I think that there's definitely a lot of angst there, but then there's also a lot of a lot of skepticism about whether machine learning or AI is actually going to solve any problems. And so there's that tension of we need to bring in AI because everybody else is doing it, but we don't need to bring in AI because it's not actually going to solve anything. That's funny. I think that we're definitely seeing that as a paranoid founder, you're constantly thinking it. You you need to constantly check check yourself. Like, are you falling into that trap? And so I think we're wary and skeptical of adding stuff when we don't know what it actually adds. And that conversation is hard with a lot of people who are like, wait, but, but doesn't it do this? And you're like, yeah, you can do chat GPT for that. But like, there's no need for for an actual product. All right. Well, for anybody who wants to get in touch with you and follow along with the work that you're doing, I'll have you add your preferred contact information to the show notes. And as the final question, I'd like to get your perspective on what you see as being the biggest barrier to adoption for machine learning today. I'll stay in the enterprise. I think it's the complexity of the deployment model where the data has to be used to be able to use machine learning. And so it's kind of a catch-22. And I think in the in the enterprise, it's a hard to get to take the data and put it somewhere where it can do it. And I think that's a, it's getting solved by, I remember that being a, definitely an issue when we were at ServiceNow. It's a legitimate worry. And so I think that part is, I think there are companies who are working towards that, kind of the enterprise data security and that stuff. But I, I think that's a barrier. On the consumer side, I don't. I don't know if there's that many barriers. I think it's incredible, like it's incredible how quickly it is starting. And I think there's a generation of people who are younger than me who are in their twenties that this is not even a question. There's not even a like it is there. You can use it. Why not? And it's it's phenomenal. So I think that that's the two views. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking the time today to join me and share the work that you're doing at 8Flow. It's definitely a very interesting product, interesting problem domain. It's great to see some of the ways that you can start to leverage some of these ML capabilities in that workflow optimization and automation area. So thank you again for taking the time today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for having me, Tobias. Thank you. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to check out our other shows, the Data Engineering Podcast, which covers the latest in modern data management, and Podcast.init, which covers the Python language, its community, and the innovative ways it is being used. You can visit the site at themachinelearningpodcast.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the mailing list, and read the show notes. And if you've learned something or tried out a project from the show, then tell us about it. Email hosts at themachinelearningpodcast.com with your story. To help other people find the show, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends and coworkers.